Yeah, incredibly thankful. If you came out for the workday, uh, just incredibly thankful for your investment in this campus. At the end of the day, it's just a building we get to gather in, right? The church is the people, but we want to steward the resources to the best of our ability. So thank you for those that came out and uh, participated. And a men's retreat happening this weekend, Friday and Saturday. For those that are attending, excited for that. Lots of life happening. Uh, and also just some life in the body. If you're familiar, uh, he was our interim pastor, John Crocker. Uh, is facing some personal health challenges. He was our interim pastor uh, after our founding pastor and then before our next lead pastor. And so incredibly thankful for the lives, for the leadership that have come, uh, that have made us who we are. And so you could be thinking of John Crocker. And then another gentleman, Gordy uh, Kazabucki, uh, is just recovering from a foot surgery. And so uh, he reached out to our prayer chain and just wanted the body to be praying for him. And so in his long road of recovery, as he described it. So if, if you're looking for prayer, one of our values around here, desperate and dependent prayer, that we long to intercede on your behalf. And that happens in life groups, but it also happens collectively. And so would love if that's something uh, you're looking for. Uh, in a couple couple weeks here, we have another family-style gathering. We care deeply on May 14th. We care deeply about our multi-generational community. And so we're going to invite the kindergartners, the fourth graders to come and worship with us, uh, either first or second service. And so trying to reflect our heart for being a multi-generational community where we can worship and learn together. And, uh, and we are continuing to look at the meals Jesus ate, who he ate with them or who he ate them with and why it matters. Because for us around here, two values drive our kids' ministry. One, we think the way kids start their adventure with Jesus has a significant impact on the trajectory of their journey with Jesus. And so we, we love being a part of that adventure. And then second, how do you equip parents? How do you partner with parents? How, how do you see parents uh, in the way God has positioned them to be the greatest influence in their kids' spiritual lives? And so constantly trying to figure out ways to uh, support parents as you guys lead your families uh, towards this vision engaging kids and empowering parents along their ever-increasing, joyful, lifetime journey with Jesus. Uh, one way, one way we're doing that, how do you equip parents? One way is we've been doing this four-week human sexuality initiative of exploring God's heart. And so last Sunday, uh, we looked at uh, what it means to be made in the image of God and that our culture screams we are simply animals, <laughs> that we are simply driven by these desires. We are slaves to these desires. And, and, and we argue, we, we believe, that the identity that Genesis tells us is that we are not a rock and there's a difference between a rock and a plant. We're not a plant. There's a difference between a plant and an animal. We're not animals. There's a difference between an animal and a human. We are made in the image of God. But sometimes what the church does is on the other side, just as the culture screams, you are nothing more than an animal in heat and you should just give yourself to your desires. The church sometimes screams that we're angels and, and that we don't have these desires, that a godly man wouldn't think that way and a godly woman wouldn't think that way. And we become these angels rather we say, well, what does it mean that God has created us in his image with these desires, not to be controlled by them, driven by them, but not to pretend that they don't exist. And so tonight, we're going to continue to explore what it means in the Song of Solomon where he says, I am my beloved, uh, as we explore what are these desires. Because uh, of all the ways God designed us to procreate, he kind of made it fun, right? I mean, this is a fun process of all the ways. I was watching my neighbor, and you guys think sometimes I filter. This is not one of those moments. I was watching my neighbor plant some, like, green beans and tomato plants, and, and my mind just starts going, of all the ways God could have designed us to procreate, I mean, could you envision he just had us, like, plant little humans, right? And then when the human's ready, you just... Just pull up the human and there it is, right? But instead, instead he's wired us with desires. And, and, and he designed a way for us to see this beautiful thing of intimacy expressed. And so we're going to try and unpack that a little bit more tonight. Uh, and you can text TABLE to 888-824-1608 if there's some questions that might be rolling around in your head as we continue that conversation. Uh, and, and as we continue in Luke... Last week, we saw illustrations of good soil. This morning, we 
we took a peek at the storm, Jesus' authority of his words. We're going to continue that thread in three stories. The demon-possessed man, this woman with blood, and Jairus' daughter, whom Jesus brings back from the dead. And so we're going to look at these stories. And do you guys love a good underdog story? You guys love underdog stories? Does this look familiar to anybody? Under the age of 40, do you guys know who these people are? This is the Mighty Ducks. We, we, love, we love underdog stories. And, uh, and this morning, uh, spoiler alert, there will be no underdog story. Instead, what we encounter is the profound authority of Jesus' words. <laughs> That there is no competition that he cannot handle and that we find our hope in his authority and his power. And so here's where we're headed this morning. Luke gives us a demonstration of the overwhelming transforming power of Jesus' authority. And then second, Jesus' polarizing healing power and the essential nature of the only appropriate response to that reality. So it's a lot of text this morning. We're going to divide it into two sections, but here's what we're going to see. Just the overwhelming, transforming power of Jesus' authority with this demon-possessed man, and then Jesus' polarizing, healing power through those next two stories, leading us to the only appropriate response, faith. So pray with me, and we'll, uh, we'll dig in this morning. God, you are so good. Thank you for who you are, what you're doing in our lives, and our world. Uh, help, help us hear from you. Help us hear the, the truth of your teaching so that we're renewed and, and shaped as we enter into our Monday to Saturday. Thank you, Jesus. Always for your glory, we pray. Amen. So two, two major texts. The first one, Jesus' authority. We're going to look at that one, and then we will turn and then look at the second story about Jesus' healing power. So we're in Luke 8. You can look in the Bible. There's a Bible in front of you, uh, or if you have a Bible, or on your iPad, your iPhone. We're in Luke 8, 26 to 56. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes. So they just gone through the storm, and now they're continuing towards this Gentile land, the Gerasenes, which is opposite of Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time, he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. Now, how might we translate it with other English words? Do was naked or running around the cemetery, right? I mean, this guy's wild. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For many a time it seized him, but he was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles. But he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, what is your name? And he said, legion. Five or six thousand in the Roman army is a legion. For many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside. And they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people from the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done. And so first, we just see Jesus' authority recognized. First, and just how Jesus steps on the scene. Because he he just operates as himself. So we're told what he's encountering. He's encountering a legion of demons. How does Jesus prepare? (laughs) What what kind of prep work? Do do we hear the eye of the tiger playing in the background? Like he starts downing raw eggs in a cup and just running around being amped up. What does he do? He simply steps on the scene. (laughs) 
Just simply who he is brings authority and power. No prep work, no calisthenics, no like plyometrics, just gearing up. He just steps on the scene and encounters this man. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, opposite of Galilee, and he stepped out on land and there meets this man. So we see this man. What do we learn about him? He's hurting, he's hurting, and he's helpless. He, he's overwhelmed by what is oppressing him. So the man from the city who had many demons, who for a long time had worn no clothes and had not lived in a house but among the tombs and was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon to the, into the desert. This man is living a, a pretty horrible life. He's, he is feeling the weight of this demonic attack. There's not much that can be done for him. He breaks these shackles. He, he's sent out away from society by these demons. He's, he's hurting and he's helpless. And then who's the next characters we see in the story? The demons. And yet something pretty interesting about the demons. Up until this point, how many people have recognized Jesus for who he is? Feels like it's been pretty few. We saw Peter say, depart from me, I'm a sinful man. We saw the centurion make some recognition of Jesus' authority. What do the demons do? They get pretty quickly who this guy is. Where do we see that in the text? This is their response as they're speaking through the man. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what do you have to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? And I think this is pretty intentional because how did the disciples respond when they saw Jesus' power just last week? Who is this man? Who is this man? <laughs> they saw his raw, unbridled power and they were overwhelmed at who he was. But their response wasn't, this is Jesus, son of the most high God. They went, who, who is this guy? The demons, on the other hand, know very deliberately who this guy is and what he's coming to do. Jesus, son of the most high, what do you have to do with us? And so we see his, his, his authority recognized. Now, I want to do a quick sidebar on this, on this idea of just spiritual warfare. And, and for some of you guys, you might think this is just a fairy tale, right? You might read these stories and think, that's a story from 2,000 years ago. How can we trust it? What, what is exactly going on? I, I want to I make the case that I think the biblical text is making a different view on how the world works, that Satan and demons are real. That we live in this physical world, right? We sleep, we wake up, we eat, we're hungry, we're thirsty, and yet there's something beyond this life that our souls, that our inner lives crave and battle against. That as much progress as we sometimes see in our society, what often happens is the inner progress that takes place in our lives isn't nearly as fast, sometimes regresses is what it feels like. Satan and demons are real that we look at this spiritual world and you can get these notes online afterwards, but they come from Grudem systematic theology. Uh, he makes a few points that we live in a spiritual world. That Paul says, whether you eat or drink, do all to the glory of God. Whether you drink coffee or orange juice, that's actually a spiritual act. That Paul says, anything not of faith is sin. That I could drink coffee or orange juice to the glory of God or actually to the detriment of sin. That everything is actually spiritual. Everything that we do has a spiritual connotation. And that there is a being who is at the head, Satan. We see that throughout these other gospels and epistles. He's referred to by different names. The ruler of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the evil one. That there is this spiritual enemy. And there is activity of Satan and demons that demons oppose and try to destroy every work of God. We see that throughout the entire biblical text. And yet, demons are limited by God's control and have limited power. We see that in Job, where he won't let Job go beyond, or Satan go beyond a certain influence with Job. That, that Jesus says, Peter, Satan wanted to have you and sift you like wheat, but we kept him from that. What is that? I picture a dog that Jesus or God has Satan on a leash, that he never allows uh, an ultimate control. Instead, God's control is, or demons are limited by God's control. And we should not think that demons can know the future or read our minds. God alone can know the future. 
And so then what, what is the relationship to this spiritual world? Um, I, I want to make a few points here again from Grudem that not all evil and sin is from Satan and demons, but some is. That Paul says our battle is against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And so I, I never want to attribute more influence than is warranted, but I also never want to pretend that it doesn't exist. That I, I don't want to pretend that there is a world that has been marred with sin from the fall, that now there's brokenness and disease and cancer. And then the flesh, there's brokenness of these desires that are now shattered and, and longing for things opposite of God's design. But, but we don't want to pretend that Satan and demons don't exist. Paul tells us world, flesh, and devil and then throughout the New Testament, it clearly recognizes the influence of demonic activity in the world. But its primary focus regarding evangelism and Christian growth is choices taken by God's people. That there are real choices we make in everyday circumstances. We make real choices. You made a real choice to come and gather with the body this morning. You made a real, whatever other factors might have been going on. More sleep, kids just getting crazy in the car as you're driving here. What other factors? The New Testament points to these choices and actions we take. And the emphasis of the New Testament isn't on the influence of demons, but on the sin that remains in the follower of Jesus' life. Yet sinning, even by Christians, does give a foothold for some kind of demonic influence in our lives. We don't believe Christians are possessed ever. We don't believe that. But it seems, and this comes from Ephesians, and I, again, I think we didn't correct that from first service either. I think it's Ephesians 4.27. Paul tells us this. There's some opposition that exists. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down in your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. For what? To influence some of that anger that you might have let go on if you didn't settle it before you went to sleep. That somehow there is some opposition and influence being given. And we ought not give a foothold for some kind of influence like that. And then, here's our confidence. Satan and demons have much less power than the power of the Holy Spirit. We need not be afraid. So how, how does this demonic force press into our world? It feels like there's two primary methodologies. Every time I read the newspaper, I can't help but think, God, what are you up to and, and why do you allow some of this to happen? Is it some force that is terrorizing the world? We believe that to be true. But we also believe there's the other side where the other strategy is to lull a world to sleep. And so I want to read a, uh, a quote from a guy named C.S. Lewis. Are you guys familiar with his book called The Screwtape Letters? Uh, he wrote a book, a fictional account of his view of how this works. And so I want to read a quote. And, and it, comes from, it comes from Uncle, an uncle, who's writing to his nephew, Wormwood. So an uncle, a high-powered demon who's writing to his, his nephew. My dear Wormwood, I wonder you should ask me whether it is essential to keep the patient, people, our world, in ignorance of your own existence. That question, at least for the present phase of our struggle, has been answered for us by the high command. Our policy for the moment is to conceal ourselves. Of course, this has not always been so. We are really faced with a cruel dilemma. When the humans disbelieve in our existence, we lose all the pleasing results of direct terrorism and we make no magicians. On the other hand, when they believe in us, we cannot make them materialists and skeptics, at least not yet. You've heard the quote that I've used from time to time around here, uh, that we are secular humanists with a spiritist vocabulary. That we claim to believe in a spiritual world and yet... When it comes down to it, we don't often operate or live in that way. We act more like materialists. I have great hopes that we shall learn in due time how to emotionalize and mythologize their science to such an extent that what it is, in effect, belief in us, though not under that name, will creep in while the human mind remains closed to the belief in the enemy. These things we experience, what are they? Are they some kind of 
influence or is it simply this life force? The worship of sex and some aspects of psychoanalysis may here prove useful. If once we can produce our perfect work, the materialist magician, the man not using but veritably worshiping what he vaguely calls forces while denying the existence of spirits, then the end of the war will be in sight. But in the meantime, we must obey our orders. I do not think you will have much difficulty in keeping the patient in the dark. The fact that devils are predominantly comic figures in the modern imagination will help you. If any faint suspicion of your existence begins to arise in his mind, suggest to him a picture of something in red tights and persuade him that since he cannot believe in that, it is an old textbook method of confusing them. He therefore cannot believe in you. That seems to be, when I look back on the past 50, 60, 70 years, that feels like the predominant movement from C.S. Lewis giving us this account, lulling people into a sleep, not believing that there is an evil force that is attacking, that is prowling around, Paul says, like a lion. Satan and demons are real. The two methodologies seem to terrorize or lull people to sleep. And if you don't believe this, again, I, it feels like wake, wake up. <laughs> there is a spiritual war that exists. Jesus said when he, when he rolls in, I came to free the captives. When we interact with people, we don't see them as enemies. <laughs> we see them as prisoners of war who are captured, who need liberation in Christ. <laughs> they need to find life in Christ. They're not our enemy. Paul says our war isn't against flesh and blood, but against powers and spiritualities, these dark forces. That it actually is a spiritual war, and the way the follower of Christ enters in is with the freedom and fearlessness that comes from this authority, knowing Jesus. And so we see Jesus' authority is recognized and now displayed. We see it, Jesus is in charge. The way he interacts with these guys, he commands them, and then he determines what they do. He gives them permission. So here's how Jesus responds. As they're tormenting this man, he said, for he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, and they begged him to command them to depart, to not to depart into the abyss. That there's an awareness, there is an abyss coming. In Revelation 20, we see an understanding that there is a final defeat of this enemy. They know it and they say, don't send us there. We would prefer to continue and have some sense of living here. Don't send us there. And so what does he do? We're going to see that in a second, right? He gives them permission. He determines where they are sent. So, Jesus' authority displayed, the man, Jesus is in charge, and the man is set free. For he had commanded the unclean spirits to come out of him. And the demons came out of the man. Jesus is in charge, and now we see this man is set free based upon the authority of Jesus' words. And it's, and it's next. What would you guess? That third character, the demons are removed and destroyed. His, re his authority is recognized. The demons came out of the man, and where did they go? The text says they entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank and into the lake and drowned. Now, this is where my limit, I feel like I reached my limits, because how, how do you drown a non-spatial being, a spirit? That doesn't make full sense to me. And yet, somehow, we're not told to read too much into that, just that it happened. These demons were given permission. They entered the pigs and drowned. What are we supposed to take from that? Where did they go? It doesn't necessarily tell us, but we're seeing Jesus' authority. So I don't know. I don't know how you drown a non-spatial spirit exactly, but this is where I don't think that's the point of what Luke's trying to tell us. He's trying to tell us about Jesus' authority. And then we see an interesting response from the herdsmen and the people. They respond in a way that uh, I think should catch us. Here's what it says. When the herdsmen saw what had happened and when the people went out to see what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country, and they were afraid. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. 
their response isn't one that drew people to say, we need to know more about this Jesus. Instead, instead fear captured them and they said, we don't want you here. And then Luke tells us how the Gentile demon-possessed man responds when Jesus' authority is realized in his life. First, he's healed. Then the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, he had been healed. And then what was his natural response? He became passionate about who this Jesus guy was that had just healed his life. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. Jesus, you changed my life. I want to follow you more. And then we see the inevitable expression of proclaiming. A man is set free, healed, passionate when he realizes Jesus' authority and he begins proclaiming. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. You guys remember this region was a Gentile region? And so I can't help but think of what this man then began to lay the groundwork for what would happen in Acts. This Gentile man returned to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much God had done for him. So as we turn a corner here to this next story, I just want to sit just for one minute in these two questions. To what extent am I experiencing the transforming power of Christ? And to what extent am I proclaiming the transforming power of Christ? Because we saw two different responses. The herdsmen and the people, how did they respond? Fear. How did the man who had been healed respond? He was passionate and he wanted to proclaim what had, just been take, what had just been done in his life. And so I wonder for us, what are we fearing? What are we afraid of? Is it nature and demons that seem so big and so overwhelming, like the storm or what just took place in this story? Is it sickness and death that just feels so looming in our life? Is it getting old? I was moving some concrete edging from our landscaped area on Friday. I'm getting old, guys. On Saturday, I just felt exhausted from moving concrete. But I'm like, this? I did nothing. What did I mean? I even had a wheelbarrow. Getting old is really hard. Is your body hurting and not strong as it used to be? Do you feel just the overwhelming fear of what that grips you with? Is it a fear of a broken mind or anxiety or depression or mental illness that just feels like it just overwhelms you at times and then it's unable to be suppressed? There's just a fear and debilitating anxiety. Is your job not secure? Are you afraid of not providing for your family? Are you afraid you'll never get married or are you afraid that the marriage you're in will never be the marriage of your dreams? Does our changing world scare you? Does it seem like the country you love is morally decaying and evil might be winning? And there's a fear that starts to permeate your thinking in your day-to-day -day life. What are you afraid of today? And yet the text tells us G Jesus' authority conquers any of our fears. Instead, we lean in. We lean in to this overwhelming, transforming power of Jesus' authority. And then Luke continues to build on that thread with two powerful stories of healing, leading us to the only appropriate response, faith. And so we saw Jesus' authority. Luke continues and wants to tell us about his healing power. And so... Here's where he goes. This is where he starts. He starts with a man named Jairus and this man's interaction along the way. Jairus, thank you. Well done. Well played. Well done. And we see Jairus or Jairus, Jairus' response, and it's one of desperation. And, and I can't help but think Luke wants us to be in this story with him because here's what he says. For, for he had only one daughter about 12 years of age and she was dying. Can you picture that in your life? 
Can you picture maybe the life of your son or daughter or someone close to you and, and the emotions that start to well up in you? I mean, we take our kids all over the place to go to these soccer games. Why? Why am I driving to Brookfield? Because I love my kids and I desperately want the best for them. We can feel the weight of this father wanting the best for his daughter and she's at death's door. And then we see a glimmer of hope. <laughs> We see a glimmer of hope where he sees and hears about this Jesus who's done some miraculous healings. Maybe this guy can help my daughter. And there's a glimmer of hope and he goes to Jesus for help. And there came a man named Jairus who was a ruler of the synagogue, different than the demon-possessed man. Now we have a well-put-together Jew who comes and says falling at the feet of Jesus, implores him to come to his house, knowing if I could just get this guy to my house, something's going to be better for my daughter. If he could just come before she dies, before that loss, she will be healed. And then Luke, I don't think by accident, includes an element where that doesn't happen quite the way he anticipated. There's a delay in the story. As they're going along the way, and you could picture, Jesus might be doing a slow walk. He's trying to get him to run. Let's go. And then Jesus stops and interacts with this next person. He begins this interaction with this woman. As Jesus went, the people pressed around him, and there was a woman. And then we see that same story of desperation in her life. Now, this is where there are moments where I am thankful for. I can't imagine. Maybe this is too much information. I can't imagine what this would look like for some of you guys as you navigate a circumstance for 12 years. That's what she said. She was bleeding for 12 years. What, what kind of desperation might that well up in you for those circumstances not to have been restored or healed despite every effort? And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. And then just like the man, she now has a glimmer of hope. <laughs> if I can only touch this guy, Jesus, there's a chance I might be restored. Here's what the story says. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. <laughs> And Jesus says, who touched me? There's this desperation and expression of hope and then healing. Jesus heals this woman. Now, one of our staff members, I thought, did a great job just referencing this. That in this society, that would be unclean and whoever she touched would become unclean. In this story, like all, when we see Jesus interact, he actually brings restoration and clean rather than being made unclean. And here's the question, and I'd encourage you, wrestle with this in your life groups. Jesus says, who touched me? Did Jesus know? Or did he not know? Is Luke trying to emphasize that Jesus knows and is inviting the woman into an interaction, demonstrating his divinity? Or is he saying, I don't know demonstrating his humanity. There's the beauty and the mystery of the incarnation. Jesus, fully God and fully man. I would encourage you, wrestle with that in your life groups. Did he know? And then those who heal testify. She turns, Jesus says, who touched me? And she responds kind of sheepishly, but eventually it was me. And then even timid faith was enough. Even the meager amount that she had, Jesus responds to. And so now we return back to Jairus' healing of his daughter. So we pause. What do you think is going to happen now? Our timing isn't always Jesus' timing. The story moves from desperation to hope. And then moves towards defeat. Jesus stopped to help someone else. And you can imagine some of the emotions that start welling up in him. And then after Jesus heals this woman, here's the news that he's 
that he receives. While he was still speaking, someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher anymore. <laughs> Those emotions of, of the circumstances of our life that in our timing aren't working out the way we would anticipate. <laughs> And there could be this feeling of defeat. And yet even in those moments, Jesus steps in and he says this. It's going to do a work. She's not dead. <laughs> While he was still speaking, Jesus on hearing this answer, do not fear, only believe and she will be well. Now, don't hear me say if we just muster enough, uh, enough faith that somehow all our circumstances are going to be alleviated. Don't hear that in the text. But here, there is this correlation to this desperate, dependent posture we take before an almighty God. And so, again, Jesus is not made unclean when he touches this corpse. And then Jesus' timing, again, might not be our timing. But what we see in this interaction Probably a familiar idea, and yet an idea we continue to anchor our lives in. Nothing is impossible for Jesus. Do not fear, only believe, and she will be well. And when they came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter, James, and John, and the father and the mother of the child. All were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. <laughs> to which they respond, Jesus, we know what a corpse looks like. And they began laughing at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called and said, Child, arise. Jesus' timing wasn't Jairus' timing. Jesus had other plans. And he pressed him, Do not fear, only believe. And by taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed something given to her to eat. And so we see this response. He takes care of the circumstantial reality of this man. But I hope the driving message that we're seeing is Jesus cares far more about the spiritual healing that's being taken, taking place in our life. That he's freeing and liberating the captives. And what does he say? The only thing that is needed Faith is all that Jesus desires from us. Where do we see that in the text? And he said to her daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. And Jesus, hearing this, answered him, do not fear, only believe. She will be well. Now, don't hear me say you should top, stop taking your anxiety medicines if you're taking any. Don't hear me say you should top, stop taking your depression medication. D don't hear me say you should stop going to the doctor. Do you hear any of that? I hope not. Don't hear that. But what I do hope you hear, Jesus cares so much about our spiritual healing, and we cling to the authority and power of his ability to take care of the circumstances. Even if not today, his timing might not be our timing, but we long for an eternal restoration with him. And there's a beautiful correlation to how we proclaim that. Our promotion of Jesus is di directly correlated to the desperation we have for him. How desperate do we look at the circumstances? We, we see the desperation of the, of, of the man in the synagogue and the woman. We see this desperation and hope they have in Jesus. What did we see in the herdsmen and the people? Fear. How did they respond to their circumstances? Jesus, leave. We, do not, we don't want anything to do with you. And so here's a couple encouragements as we go into our Monday to Saturday. We are in a spiritual war with a real enemy. If you're unaware of that, just turn on the TV, look at Twitter for any amount of time. There's a spiritual war that either terrorizes or lulls people into sleep. We recognize there is a spiritual reality that we interact with every single day. Wake up to that. And yet there is a beauty. Jesus, authority, and power are as real today as they were in these stories. That we cling with confidence to that reality and that he longs to heal. <laughs> but David, you don't understand how frayed the relationships are in my family. <laughs> You don't understand the precarious nature of my job insecurity right now. If I, if I make one wrong move, I, I don't know how I'm going to move forward. Our confidence is that Jesus does want to heal these circumstances in our lives. 
not responding like the herdsmen and the people, but more like these other three. And then we can find that there is no fear in Jesus' name. He who is in this world, is he greater than the one in us? No, the biblical text says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There is no fear in Christ. And there is great joy in sharing this healing power with others. So I'm going to invite the worship team up. And I want to pray the same prayer we've been praying over this entire section in the teachings of Jesus. I want to pray this same prayer over us that you've been hearing. God, help me to listen closely to your teaching so they reshape and renew me to know your truth in whatever you invite me into today. God, you are so good. We want to believe more fully that you are active in this world. May we have more faith to cling more tightly to the promises that you've given us. The way we discover those promises, God, help us to listen closely to your teachings so they reshape and renew us to know your truth in whatever you're inviting us into today. Always for your glory, we pray. Amen.